With Session Update, I'm Julie Bartke. The Capitol restoration is in. The Mayo Clinic expansion is out. Governor Mark Dayton released his 2013 bonding proposal earlier today. It comes in at $750 million, and the, um, that's the amount of debt service Minnesota Management and Budget says the state can spend this year. Now, with the largest amount is dedicated to the state cap, state's capital's in the, uh, aging infrastructure. Excuse me. Now, the overall picture has 34% of the dollars heading to Greater Minnesota projects, 23% for projects the governor says have statewide impact, and 19% for the U and for Minsku. For more details, here's the governor's news conference from earlier today. Announcing this morning my 2013 bonding proposal, $750 million. That would create, according to the national formula we use, 21,000 jobs all over the state of Minnesota. These are projects, many of which were delayed uh, even before I took office, and by uh, vetoes or opposition, which have been delayed for the last uh, two years because of legislative opposition, the majority then, and I really am hopeful and believe uh, it's very, very important that these uh, projects, for example, the Rochester, Mankato, and St. Cloud downtown revitalization projects are supported and have a chance to move forward. It uh, does not contain uh, anything at this time for the uh, Destination Medical Center for Rochester, although I strongly support that and would strongly support the bonding if that becomes part of the package, but that uh, hasn't been established yet. The largest uh, State project, which uh, uh, is is for hundred for the uh, for the capital here for 109 million dollars, and Commissioner Kronk is available to talk a little more about that and the, the details of it. But it would get about ha almost half of the total project, over half of the remaining uh, funds owed necessary to, to undertake and then complete this project. The other 95 million being due next uh, next year in a bonding bill next year. Um, in terms of the distribution, 43% are metro projects. Uh, the capital capital restoration here uh, really skews that number um, in the in favor of the metro area. 34% of it's in Greater Minnesota, and 23% are statewide projects that serve both uh, metro and Greater Minnesota. Higher education. Uh, 19%, we, I told both Minsku and the University of Minnesota I wanted projects that were focused on bringing their uh, curricula up to into the modern era and, and aligning their, what they're offering with the jobs of the future and also into modernizing laboratories, classrooms, equipment, technology, so that they're training young people on the uh, technology that they'll be using and, when, and they can come out job ready. Uh, I think that's about it. I'm, 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 you know, obviously this depends on the legislature, uh, you know, bipartisan way making a, a concurrence. They have their own ideas. That's uh, the way it always is. And that's the way it should be. So we'll start talking with them about which of these projects. I, sh I should say that you know there, are, we had about 2.5 billion dollars of projects uh, to consider, and many of the ones that uh, could not be included are really very, very worthy projects. Very necessary. Some of the improvements to the public uh, facilities. Uh, we've got fun, re, funding in here. Asked for the St. Peter facility, uh, the uh, but the other human services facilities and some of the corrections facilities are long overdue for the kind of uh, upgrades that they need as well. So there's a lot here that there's a lot that isn't here that I wish we had the capacity to to uh, fund and. Um, Commissioner Sowalder, I'm told, sold the bonds last uh, August, the last time there was a sale at 2.05 rate of interest, and um, he's promised me he can have, have that uh, for this next round. So if that's the case, we'll, we'll be back again. So, Commissioner. Thank you, Governor. And regarding the Capitol, we are certainly at a tipping point. This building, as you all know, has reached a point in its life where restoration is critical to extend the life of the building and reduce costs for the next 100 years. There's such significant deterioration of stone, the risk of leaky piping, lack of ventilation in some areas, outdated electrical systems, infrastructure inadequate for future technology, technology needs, and disorganization of offices. So the time to act is now. 
By delaying a comprehensive preservation effort, we face the consequences of large annual expenses borne to the taxpayer to address these problems without fixing or solving the root cause. Failure to move forward now will cost the state significantly more due to deterioration and inflation. This issue has been studied multiple times, as you all know. Um, over 30 years of plans have been put on the shelf, and I want to thank the governor for committing the $109 million needed to continue this project. Thanks, Governor. Questions on the bill, and then we'll open it up to anything else. Traditionally, uh, Governor's legislators have been a relatively modest bond bill in the uh, so-called budget years, the odd number of years, and the larger one, secondary plan. Why are you doing such a large bill this year? Well, first of all, it, it, we have the debt capacity uh, already built into the the forecast, the one last uh, February, the one last November. So this was the scope of a bonding bill we anticipated. As I said, there are a lot of really vitally needed projects that had to be left out. And given the backlog from previous uh, governor's vetoes and from the legislative, uh, lack of legis legislative support the last two years, uh, there's just a huge need for it. And the interest rates are extremely low. And we want a lot of people, especially in the building trades, who need work, want to work. And uh, this will put them to work all over Minnesota. So those are the combination reasons. So what do you do next year? How big a bill? I, I, haven't, I haven't looked at it, thought of it. It depends on the economic conditions at that point and everything else. So it's, it, again, uh, as I said before, there are $109 million in the uh, request here for the capital re renovation. The $95 million would remain. Uh, 30, $38 million was uh, provided the last uh, bonding bill for that project, so $242 million in total. And, you know, so that would say that we really would have need a bonding bill next year uh, in order to uh, keep that project moving in a timely fashion. Uh, when you meet regularly with Republicans, what groundwork have you laid to get their support? Because obviously their votes are needed to get this over time. Well, we talked about it last uh, week at breakfast, and you know they were they were interested. We get copies of the bill. Where's Jamie? We got copies of the bill to them uh, last Friday as they requested, and haven't followed up with them or with the Democrats either. But we'll do that this week, and obviously we need. Uh, this to be a bipartisan support, as it has been the last two years, and there are a number of projects in here that were come from districts that are represented by Republican senators or representatives. So, you know, I'm I'm hopeful that we'll get the kind of support we need. I expect this will go down to the very end of the session. This is one of the ones where people can try to use to their advantage, which is part of the process. So, you know, obviously it won't pass if there aren't Republicans who will support it, or or whatever version comes out. This year, what would be the consequence for the capital project, and, and then what would be the consequence for that remaining $95 million increment? Well, certainly the, the cost delays and then the basically buttoning up of the, the project as it is. We have the construction manager, the architects on board, and so we would have to put a hold on their contracts. So we haven't put a dollar amount on that, but it's significant, and I think the momentum that we've seen the commitment from the Capital Preservation Commission uh, to make sure that this project is completed in a comprehensive way um, is critical. So um, we're, we were uh, required by legislation to give the number that's needed to continue this project this year, and that number is $109 million. Well, the follow-up on that, the, you, you mentioned the tipping point that has capital. What, what does that mean? Sure. You know, we, we've hired uh, David Hart, who was a consultant for the, the state, the, of, of Utah's restoration project. And he often compares uh, what we're doing here in Minnesota to both what they're doing in Utah and then the deterioration of some older buildings in Europe, for example. And we can either decide if we're gonna do a comprehensive project today or if we're gonna see scaffolding like you have seen around the building for the next 50 years. And so we can either do this once and for all and make sure that we are preserving this capital for the next 100 years, or we can see this in a constant state of asset preservation. And every time they put up scaffolding, they hear about it from me. Uh, and then I hear about it. <laughs> you know, I, I think the, the commission, which I was uh, tasked by the legislature to chair at the end of the 2011 session, 
We've been meeting regularly and it's been bipartisan. We've had excellent participation by both DFL and Republican legislators. Uh, this is, you know, it's, this is not partisan. None of us would choose to do this. Well, you know, all of us get to spend uh, some period of time uh, outside of this building entirely, which uh, at, at a place yet to be specified, but you know, it's not gonna be easy. It's not gonna be uh, pleasant, it'll be disruptive, but I think everybody recognizes that we have to get it done, that it's a safety hazard, that people, who work here, come in every and out every day, including yourselves, that uh, visitors come in here every day and that we owe it to to, the, to their safety and protection as well as to the you know generations of Minnesotans who will get the benefit of this to do it and do it right, and I think we'll do that. Governor, unlike uh, previous uh, bonding bills in past years, uh, there's a, a strong concentration here on downtowns around the state. Uh, you, you have a theory about this. So would you tell us what that is? Well, I learned from my father and my uncles that uh, focusing on downtown re revitalization is crucial and it needs to be ongoing, that the natural tendency of development projects, shopping centers and the like, is to go out to the greenfield areas in the suburbs or the exurbs. And, and if you look at some of the projects like uh, downtown St. Paul, uh, where I, uh, I was last week with uh, Mayor Coleman, I mean, the, the amount of remedial work that has to be done, the expense of that, is uh, something that has to be a hurdle has to, you have to get over in order to move ahead. Same thing with the, the uh, c center in Arden Hills that was considered the Vikings. That's a fabulous prime spot of real estate, but it's, it's 30 plus million dollars of environmental repair to be done before it can be considered by a developer. So th that's the reason why these projects are important in downtown Rochester, downtown Mankato, downtown St. Cloud. These are very significant regional centers. There's also project in here for Duluth. We funded one last year in Duluth uh, through the deed uh, money. So, you know, it's just, you have to keep focusing on downtowns or you end up with a classic donut effect where there's nothing downtown and, and, and you got blight and all the problems that come in when there is a, a vacuum in, in the center city. And uh, I hope, uh, I've been mystified, frankly, for the last uh, two sessions why the leadership couldn't understand that or didn't want to, but I'm optimistic, hopeful, that we'll get a better reception this year. Why, why is that? You have to ask them. I, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's an absolute mystery to me. If you look at some of the people representing those three cities and their positions in the leg legislature last year, uh, it's quite beyond my comprehension. Governor, do you have a list of uh, how many of these projects are in DFL districts or in Republican districts? I don't, and uh, I don't think I don't. We didn't. I, I never had that discussion, uh, except for the need to have it be balanced and have uh, there be projects that. Uh, obviously, one of the reasons legislators support the. Uh, these bills is because there are projects in it uh, for their districts, whether they're Republican or Democrat, and uh, one of the reasons they don't support it is when there aren't projects for them. And of course, that's why you know the, the House and Senate's participation now is vitally important, and they have their own ideas of what they want to do. And and so you know that that will be end up being part of the mosaic. It was the last two years because of the again the 60% requirement needed DFL legislators. The last two years need Republican this one. So. Uh, you know, both of the uh, conference committees on the bonding bills, 2011-2012, were bipartisan and, and fairly, you know, collegial. And I think that's just in the con continuation of what preceded uh, my administration and what will continue on. Just to follow the House bonding bill chair said she wanted it to be at 800 million, 750 year, year top. Oh, I'm, I'm negotiable. I mean, that's, we're not far off on that. I don't know what the difference is in the. Uh, the uh, interest that would accrue to the um, next biennial budget, but it's, I, I, it's, it's probably manageable, and I don't know if the Senate has come out with a firm target yet, but I would hope we'll be in that ballpark. But again, you know, Re Republican leaders will have something to say about that. And the last two bills, they were insistent that it not be over $500 million, and neither one exceeded that. By Governor, what's your analysis on why the capital renovation has taken this long or why we're talking about safety and crisis and tipping point? Well, it was put off by pr uh, previous governors and legislatures, you know, and it's not a, it's not a pleasant undertaking. It's very expensive and, uh, you know, r belief is we'll be 
out of here for probably about two years, whether they can hold uh, legislative sessions in the chambers during that time or whether they will be out entirely is uh, still undetermined. But, you know, it's a project that easier, was easier to avoid until it reached the point where it couldn't be responsibly avoided any longer. And that's, you know, why, again, there's been good bipartisan support in, in this uh, uh, Senator Dave Senjum, uh, Representative Matt Dean, you've know, been active participants in the commission and, you know, very, very constructive involved. And, you know, everybody realizes this just has to be done, and now we're going to do it. Governor, if the uh, Republicans were to try to link the bonding, they're both on the bonding bill, <coughs> excuse me, to uh, scaling back on some of the uh, post tax increases, what would be a stance on that? I'm sorry, link it to what? If they were going to link it to proposed tax increases, in other words, their votes contingent on scaling back some of the tax increases you and the Democrats have proposed. Well, they've been separate issues in the past. You know, I, I vetoed the, ta the tax bill uh, both years, and uh, the bonding bill passed both years. I mean, again, I think I think there's a separation in there clearly, and I, I would you know resist efforts to link them. I mean, ultimately, legislators have to decide whether they're going to support 21,000 jobs or not. And uh, you know, to me, that's the overwhelming imperative here is to put people to work at, throughout Minnesota as well as to make really very important and, and necessary uh, capital improvements that are going to benefit people all over the state for, for years to come. So I think it has its own compelling reasons. Uh, I, I would not myself allow it to be linked uh, with a, a tax bill. Governor, past, past governors have applied to different tests, whether it be project has to be a statewide or regional what recipe was it that, that won your support for the things that you put in? Well, we have a lot more projects uh, that we couldn't fund that meet those two criteria than are on this list. Uh, but being ready to move ahead, shovel ready, so-called, or as uh, Tom Simpson says, you know, what is it, brush and paint? Paintbrush ready. What? Paintbrush ready. Paintbrush ready is even faster in terms of job creation. So. Uh, those projects were certainly considered. We have a few in there that are about uh, design, but there are f many more that were rejected because they involved uh, just preliminary work and design work, and you know that as, is necessary, but it's not going to put people to many people to work very soon. Uh, you know, regional significance and local significance. I mean, you know, we're a mosaic of of, of all these projects and others. And what benefits, you know, one benefits all. I, I, I don't, you know, I understand the, the difference in the concept. If you fund Minsky campuses on paper, you're funding the, the whole state or the University of Minnesota. But in, in practicality, you're funding a specific project in, in Winona or a specific project in Worthington. And, and, you know, that's more local in its impact. But it's very important. You put people to work there. And... Uh, you know, people don't work globally, they work locally. So uh, I, I make no apologies for that. I think we have a variety of, you know, projects to cover, you know, a whole spectrum from about a quarter of more local development and 14% uh, are public safety. And there's some crucial, as I mentioned, uh, for the state hospital in St. Peter and, uh, and uh, the, um, I think it's Moose, Moose Lake facility and, and, well, the fence around Shakopee. Uh, prison for uh, corrections. So, you know, we put in the money for the <clears throat> complete the uh, veterans home at, at uh, Fort Snelling, which is uh, 52 million, 54.1 million, and uh, that's a big, big piece of uh, the total, and it's a very significant commitment. But we felt that was, you know, very important to get that project completed for the safety and the well-being of the veterans who reside there. So, you know, each one had its own imperative, and I think each one will be very beneficial. And I, yet I also know that they're not all going to make it uh, to the final, to the finish line, given the nature of the legislature will have its own ideas. You mentioned the Rochester Destination Medical Center project. Do you think general obligation bonds are the right tool for that project's uh, infrastructure financing? Well, I'm d d depending on my excellent chief of staff, uh, Tina Smith, to make that determination along with legislators. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that it's not. I don't know that it is. I'm un undecided. I, if it is part of a, a bonding bill, you know, it will be, again, a very significant part of it. So if there are other ways to do it that 
uh, can fit within the scope of the project, then you know we certainly ought to take a close look at them. But obviously, uh, if it, we do move ahead and make a commitment in this year, the legislature and this geo bonding, then it's going to be in at least part of it is going to be in this bill. I mean, the Mayo project is you know, 600 million. I guess now it's being said 565 in over 30 over 20 years. I mean that averages out to less than $30 million a year, which is not insignificant, but it's something that could be handled in a, in a variety of ways. You could cover it you know, with just the cash payments. Now, it doesn't commit, you can't commit future governors, future legislatures, and I understand part of Mayo's desire is to make sure that we're on board here and we're moving ahead, but to me, they're, they're, you know, it's a question of what's the best financing option, it's not a question of whether there are financing options. Why such a high percentage of projects in greater Minnesota? Well, 34% in greater Minnesota. Some people will say that's too low. Some will say it's just right. Some will say it's too high. That's been the way it's been here since 1977 when I arrived, and that'll be the way it'll be in 2077 when I'm gone. If you take out the $109 million for the capital, is that, gives you a, is that more balance to that point? I'd, I'd, you know, guesstimate, so we're selling 750, so down to 650, I mean, approximately balanced. And you have a lot of things like street projects in here that we haven't seen in recent years. Why? Well, first of all, they're ready to go. Uh, they're, you know, shovel ready, repair ready. They are projects that have uh, been languishing. I mean, local governments, the cost of these projects now are outstripping the means of local governments. and increasingly state government. I mean, what it used to co cost to build an entire highway re renovation was is now the cost of the design and engineering study. We had projects uh, that I turned down here uh, that were, had uh, wanted $6 million for design and engineering, I mean, I, for buildings. I mean, it's like you used to be able to build a building for that or close to it. So, you know, we're looking for projects where communities that, you know, these said these and could prove that these are vital to their, uh, to their vi continued vitality and uh, where the need was, was acute. And, you know, those are local rather than regional. But, again, you look at uh, those uh, cities, they have great uh, significance beyond their boundaries to the to the region. Governor, there's a proposal working through the Senate that would um, allocate some bonding money to be used to buy up in environmentally sensitive areas where silica sand mining might be done. Just kind of wondered if you have a thought. About I, that. I haven't. I'm not really uh, knowledgeable about that. You know, I mean, at this point, anything is an option. It has to get passed uh, by the two bodies, and then we'll sit down with. And negotiate and see what see what they really come forward with. But you know, this is the idea stage, and that's fine too. But Governor, on Friday, Senator Bach questioned me for a large bonding bill uh, this year. Have you had discussions with them and the rest of the Senate DFL leadership about the bonding bill? Not focused in on on that aspect. We you know we, they have their own prerogatives, obviously, and Senator Bach has his own reasons, which he could elaborate on. And you know, if we'll we'll see it, you know what comes through the Senate, out of the Senate, and, um, but, you know, I, I, obviously it takes, uh, in this case, three to tango, so uh, the Senate will have to come along with something that will be approximately where the House or, and I are, or the House and I will have to come down to where the Senate is. We'll have to work that out, and I'm confident we will. Are there uh, omnibus transportation bills, you know, bill today? Do you have, um, Could we, is there anything else on the bonding? Yeah, how soon are you going to displace us from the pressure? How oh, what? How soon are you going to displace us from the Uh, you'll be the, you'll be the last to leave and the first to return. How's that? <laughs> and if nothing drops on any of your heads, then the rest of us will follow, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's not going to be, we, I, we haven't even gotten the point of where, where people will go, and we haven't gotten the point of who's going to be here when they come back. Uh, I mean, obviously you guys will, but they're... That's where uh, that's where we get, get the bonding co money committed now before they get into whose whose offices are going to stay here and or be here when they come back and whose are not and what's going to happen. I mean that's. I remember when uh, Lieutenant Governor Marlene Johnson was she she was down at the very far end there uh, next to the door and she wanted to come back here and be proximate to the purposes office and uh, the, the legislature at least then I assume now is, you know controls the, the capital and the space, and uh, so she went to see Speaker of the House Bob Anasik, and 
He looked at her and smiled. He said, you know, Marlene, administrations come and go, but space is forever. So, <laughs> so that's when the real uh, crunch comes. But I, I, we'll, we'll work it out. Governor, was the bonding money for uh, the Army ammunition plant in that area, is that kind of a, a little nod towards them losing the Viking Stadium? Is that is there a little compensation for the loss? Well, I, I said that last year. You know, I mean, that is a, that's that's the best development site proximate or within the metropolitan area that I'm, I'm aware of. And and basically, it needs to be cleaned up. And then I think it's a prime development site for Arden Hills, but for Ramsey County and for the, the region. So I support it uh, even if it hadn't been part of the stadium you know, consideration. And the federal government is pays for some part of it. I think we were in $5 million, is it? Once the federal government will clean up the site, is That's my right. understanding. Yeah, so this will, you know, put it in, a, after those two projects, put it in a position where it can attract something that will, uh, could, could ultimately prove even more uh, beneficial economically, or at least as beneficial as the stadium. Anything else on the Bonnie Bill? Governor. I believe you initially talked about releasing something in March, perhaps, and it took a little bit longer. Any particular reason for that? Uh, just a lot of irons in the fire, and the legislature became clear was not going to be moving on theirs, uh, you know, in a way that we were holding things up. We checked on that, uh, you know, several times, make sure we were not holding any, anything up on their process, and we're not. So, uh, they've, you know, we've got six weeks to go now, and I think this will be plenty of time. We wanted to make sure we got it right, and we wanted to do due diligence on the project. So, I, you know, I think we're, still, we're relatively timely. All right, anything else? You guys, <clears throat> excuse me, I told them they could either leave or stay around and watch the carnage. So, <laughs> so let the carnage begin, uh, yeah. Well, the equal tab numbers are up for March. They're low again. What's your reaction to that? And how long will the state wait for these numbers to get better? Well, you know, it occurred to me over the weekend that, you know, when the stadium issue was up last year, I was told by several of you that, you know, anything, any story about the stadium, you know, got, more hits than anything and everything else. And uh, I'm just really looking forward to the NFL draft upcoming so that you'll all have something else to focus on relative to the Vikings in the stadium. I think this has been blown so far out of proportion to the problem. I mean, we're, how much is the annual payment? 20 to $30 million a year? I mean, we're not talking about significant money in the scheme of a you know, state budget, 35, $37, 38000000000 billion of biennium. And we'll come up with a solution. I mean, we have six weeks now, and uh, I have con chairing a meeting, convening a meeting this week with the, uh, really appreciate Senator Rosen, who was uh, involved in this, and Senator Champion, who was not as directly involved, uh, co-chairing this uh, you know, legislative group. And we're gonna put all the possible ideas on the table and see which ones are you know, most uh, assured and see which ones are, uh, you know, have, would have the most support. And again, it'll need to be bipartisan, but, you know, I don't want to see this project fail. It, it shouldn't fail. I don't think the majority of the legislature wants to see it fail. I know the public uh, isn't going to benefit from that. So to me, this is a very, you know, solvable problem. And, and uh, I think it was something we'll, we need to get done, and we'll get done before the end of the session. Well, Governor, you said uh, earlier that it's premature to look at all the revenue sources, but it sounds as if you've changed your mind on that now, that it needs to happen this legislature. I mean, whether this is in conjunction with the, uh, you know, the, the, you know, continuing the pull tabs or as a substitute, I mean, I, I'm open to the best suggestions. I, I think it's, given, given all the, you know, the tumult that has been created around this and, you know, now, you know, legislative grandstanding says, well, we can't issue the bonds until we have somebody, whoever it is, uh, you know, certify their, you know, their, their credit worthiness, which is what the bond market will do. I mean, you can't sell bonds if the investors aren't assured they're going to get pay, pay, repaid. But, you know, it's just, I want to find a solution that, every, uh, you know, at least on a bipartisan basis, people can buy into and uh, that assures the public, as they should be assured, that this is on sound financial ground. And as I say, it's not that insurmountable a financial problem. It's more, at this point, who, who can make, uh, take political advantage out of it. Are you interested in taking another look at the casino, Governor? Uh, whether it be for the stadium, one for the stadium, or otherwise? Other? 
it hasn't come up this session. I'm, I'm not aware. I don't think something like that's going to be able to pick up, uh, you know, whatever this gap is uh, immediately. It'll be all sorts of issues to be dealt with in, in building anything new or expanding anything. So um, I don't rule anything out at this point, but that's not top of my list. Do you think there's a need for a plan B? Well, I think if we come up with one and put this to rest, uh, you know, for the sake of the public and for the sake of, you know, future uh, possible investors, I think it's, it's all to the good. And since it's come up now, we have six weeks left in the session, and presumably what we would come up with would require legislative approval. It's better to do it in the next six weeks than wait till next year. Governor, the Minnesota lottery says it is looking uh, at your office's direction, looking at electronic games, expanding the lottery, moving to that. Is that something you are interested in? Again, all good ideas are welcome. I don't know that they, they, they uh, believe that that was quite their intended response uh, in, uh, to media inquiries in the last week, because uh, you know they're they're not they're not uh, they, they're very cognizant that uh, the legislature prescribed uh, parameters for this backup uh, source, the uh, theme Viking theme based lottery. And so I, I, I'm not aware they're going willy-nilly uh, uh, looking at all sorts of uh, expanded or new games and possibilities. But um, they'll be part of the discussion, certainly, and we'll rely on them to, whether there's sufficient uh, security in, in, you know, in a lottery game. Well, they, they are, in fact, doing this, and they say they're doing it at the direction of your office. Uh, but they are very cognizant of the, of the fact they say that they need legislative Authorization well, we've asked them, we've asked uh, others, you know, give us your good ideas. So, so I mean, yes, that would have come from uh, my chief of staff, uh, Tina Smith, and Deputy uh, Dana Bailey in terms of, you know, no noodle this around, give us your best ideas. On another subject, there's significant consternation at the possibility of uh, the U of M hospitals becoming controlled by something, someone outside of Minnesota. What's, what are your thoughts on that? Should there be legislation? How are you involved? Well, I commend uh, Attorney General Swanson. I think she uh, played a, a very, very significant role, very constructive role in, you know, bringing these matters to light. Uh, these are uh, decisions that'll be made with huge uh, public impact, and the public and the legislature and, and everyone else needs to be fully aware before they progress any farther. Uh, and I was pleased to see uh, Chairman of the Fairview Board, um, um, Chuck Moody, saying that. If the university objected, they would not proceed to, to consummate a, a deal with uh, Sanford. I mean, to me, if you're looking at the, the economic base of this state for, for a successful future, medical care and medical technology is absolutely one of the top opportunities that we have, and it's a very real opportunity. You know, Mayo is world uh, preeminent and wants to continue to be so, and wants to uh, make this their, 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 found, their center place in Rochester, and that benefits the state enormously. And if the University of Minnesota uh, improves the quality of the medical school, I, I keep pointing out, I was pre-med in college, and when I applied to medical schools in the fall of 1968, uh, I applied to the eight best, uh, highest rated in the country, and Minnesota was one of the eight, and now it's variously rated in the middle 20s. So we can't be a premier medical uh, location for companies, uh, for medical students, and, and all the uh, related benefits that we don't have of, of top-of-the-line medical school. And I'm told by, uh, I've discussed this with President Kaler since he arrived, and I think he's supportive of that and cognizant of that need and, and believes that uh, reacquiring at least the, the university uh, hospital, and now run by, owned and run by Fairview, is crucial to being able to uh, have that, that kind of uh, first-rate uh, medical training and education program, and the others, I guess, are, you know, as part of this, you know, so-called feeder system. Uh, I'm, I'm not, you know, I mean, one of my priorities would make sure that anything involving that has a really a good management structure established, and I think that can be done. But I was out in Chask about six months ago, and for an economic development regional summit, and, and there were about 50 business owners and executives of companies whose names I, I, I almost hadn't heard of. And they were six months or a year or five years, 10 years old. And uh, 
It was actually one of the best uh, discussions I've had on business climate. They're not indifferent to taxes and those concerns, but they think we have a terrific business climate because of the spinoff of technology and ideas, innovations from the university, and their concern is that there be that continuing font of, of that, uh, those ideas and, and connections. So this is something that's already real in Minnesota, and it's a tremendous opportunity, and these are you know, it's saving lives and it's relatively uh, low impact uh, environmentally and it brings in, you know, intelligent people, uh, uh, well, well paid people. So uh, to me, the, if we do uh, establish Mayo and the university as they're describing now in the next 10 to 20 years, I mean, th that will be an epicenter for medical care and medical technology that will be w one of the preeminent ones in the country and the entire world. And that's an opportunity we just can't let go by. If we want to talk about jobs of the future and better jobs for Minnesotans, ones that emphasize our strengths, good education, good quality of life and the like, I mean, this is, this is a, 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 as good an opportunity as we will have. What is your preference that the hospital come back under the umbrella of the university? And, you know, it's premature, I think, to, I'd say, to say that. I believe this process is going to go on for for months now and you know the university will have to do its due diligence and if we're asked for state participation which I believe we will be we're going to certainly do our due diligence on it and as I say that's you know it's a big undertaking the university wasn't able to to run its own hospital successfully uh, you know years ago but that's why Fair, Fairview took it over and so you know I have high confidence in, in the Mayo's ability to manage uh, an undertaking as they're proposing. They, they've demonstrated that they can run a very, you know, financially efficient and successful project as well as a preeminent medical one. And I, I believe the university is capable of that, but I sure want to make, I want to make certain of it before I, I agreed to commit to state uh, funds, bonding, whatever it's going to be into that uh, endeavor. And so, I mean, I just think it's, it's, I don't, you know, the university can say what point they think it is, it is in, in this. And, you know, and, and what the timetable is for the project, but it's my understanding it's, it's you know, a matter of months. It's not as advanced as the mail. Some of the talks have been going on for months. Um, have, was your office informed of these? Have you weighed in on this at all before? Uh, I was, uh, President Kaler informed me, just sketched, sketched out the possibility about two months ago. I wasn't... Um, I, uh, about, and that was, that focus was on the university acquiring the former university hospital uh, from, Fair, from Fairview, not the whole uh, operation. So about three weeks ago or so, he talked with me about that expanded concept. And, you know, we're, I'm, again, I, I've, I'm enthusiastic about it for the reasons I just described, but it's a big, big financial commitment and for the university and for the state if it proceeds the way they're Talking, so we, you know, we got a lot of a lot of due diligence to do before ready to say yes. So you're saying nothing this legislative session? I don't. I'm not aware of anything this session. Uh, you know, if, uh, in terms of a significant financial commitment, it, it would be very premature unless there's something I'm not aware of. I don't know if the university feels they need legislation of any kind to be able to pursue this as a possibility. I, I don't. I don't know yet. But I, I, my sense is there's nothing that's going to be absolutely required this session. I want to clear my confusion here. The one time, one, I'm back in the waiting state. One hand, you're saying it's it's solvable, being overblown. On the other hand, you're saying you're convening some lawmakers to, to come up with a backup financing option, perhaps yet this session. Do they need to do something this session? And also, is there any talk of having the Vikings up their contribution to the project, given that the it's not off the ground yet. Nothing is ruled out. I, I mean, it hasn't, I haven't had that discussion with anyone. I mean, I just think it's overblown because, as I say, it's a $20, you know, $20 million a year problem, $20 to $30 million a year, which, uh, you know, is, is a significant amount of money, but it's, you know, it's not, it's within our scope of our uh, capabilities to, to solve that, and, and we will. And, uh, you know, I think it's the silver lining in the cloud is that it came to light as it did. and. And so there is the pressure now, legislative pressure, public pressure, political pressure to uh, get it resolved. And so now is a good time to do it. And as I say, it can be a backup for the e-pull tabs. It can be uh, in, in, in conjunction with e-pull tabs. It could be conceivably in place of e-pull tabs. I mean, 
But I, I you know, we're going to get a solution so we don't get into, you know, as I say, leave ourselves open for the kind of grandstanding that says, well, you don't, can't issue the bonds and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just people are just, you know, clearly going to use that to their political advantage. And uh, I, it's, it's too big, it's too important a project. 7,000 people working on that project. And if that project were, were to be delayed for any period of time, they'd be, they'd be drawn unemployment checks rather than going to work. And uh, ultimately, I think that's uh, what legislators will need to consider. If there is any uh, revi revision that requires their approval, they're going to have to decide whether they want to put people to work or keep them on the bench. Have you told the Vikings that they might have to pay more? I, was, I, they have not, they I haven't had, I, I, I saw Leslie Frazier in passing at the Page Foundation event last Saturday. That's the only contact I've had with anybody. And Jared Allen was there. And uh, the only two, only contact I had with any of them, Frazier at eye level. And, Jared Allen about that level. So I haven't had any conversations with, uh, and also uh, NFL Commissioner uh, Goodell was there, and he just he just inquired. We we're you know walking together, and 10 seconds I said, you know, we're, it's a solvable problem, and we're gonna we'll solve it. Governor, the House and Senate uh, Transportation Chairs are gonna release their bills today. Uh, it's gonna include gas tax and a transit tax. Can you support that? I I propose the. the transit tax myself. I don't know what, what level they're proposing, but I don't don't support a gas tax. I, I don't think the people of Minnesota are prepared to support it, and that's that's the critical consideration. And you know, I've told Commissioner Zelli that we want to use his business acumen and and talent and and pull together a, a financing package for the uh, scope of the the transportation needs in the state, especially the highway renovations and improvements. And then he and I and others will need to go sell that to uh, the people of Minnesota, the, the way uh, Commissioner France went all over the state. And well, of course, we saw how his uh, and my efforts fared. But you know, we'll take a big crack at it, but only in the context of really accomplishing what's needed. I mean, a billion dollars, you know, given the scope of these projects and the, these major ones, and I agree with their analysis. I mean, these projects, Highway 14 and and others like that are, you know, urgently needed and, and desperately overdue, and yet one of those is alone costs 600, 700 million, so to do the entire project. So we need to come up with a, some kind of means of financing them, and it's more than just a gas tax if there were to be one in the future, it has. And we have to persuade Minnesotans, this is not just about repairing this is about improving. This is about you know additional lanes. This is about additional safety. This is about you know projects that are all over the state going to benefit the entire state that would be uh, fa funded or fast forwarded if uh, if this package were supported, and uh, I think that's going to be a prerequisite for getting the public support. Governor, I, the gas tax is, is not um, is not the way to go. Is there another uh, source of funding for the road and bridge? to go along with the metro sales tax that you'd be willing to support sort of a statewide transportation bill? Well, I, we have a limited amount of bonding money in here for roads and bridges, and I would be the first to say it's not sufficient to meet the needs around the state. And, and this is, again, another inheritance we have, have from the, you know, the previous 20 years when, when you know, three, three governors after purpose declined to fund transportation projects to the level needed. And it's, again, it's convenient to, to avoid them and you don't have to pay for them then and you don't have the, the disruption during while they're being constructed. But when we came in tw uh, you know, two, two years ago, I mean, 20 years of that, except for one, you know, one gas tax increase and that by itself is just insufficient. Uh, all the, I mean, the congestion of the metro area, the deterioration of the trunk highway system, greater Minnesota, I, I mean, I've been driving all of the state for two years, I was well aware of. The deterioration, and uh, you know, now we, we don't have a funding source, and we don't have a public recognition. I think it's a public recognition of a problem, but not not of the uh, desirable source. And again, to propose uh, for me to propose an increase in the gasoline tax, which may become part of a whole package in the future, but by itself is not going to solve the pr the problem, and not even really make a significant dent in it. Just to me, is is, is premature and would be counterproductive. So. <laughs> Mayo Clinic's going to take another run at the House taxes this week. What do you think of some of the concerns Chair Lachowski's raised about the fact Rochester, as Trump's, should have been, uh, should pay more of its, lift more of the weight as far as low as You're saying behind her rather than in front of her. Yeah. And, uh, 
you know, do you think some of the critiques she's raised are valid that, you know, maybe Mayo's asking for money they shouldn't be asking for, maybe the local community should lift more of the burden itself, maybe we should take a harder look at the funding mechanism itself? Well, Mayo, Mayo is well within its rights to ask for whatever they think they need, and the legislature is well within its rights to review that and consider other possibilities. I'm, I'm having lunch tomorrow with Representative Lancheski, so I'll have a chance to discuss this with her in more detail, but it's, you know, my understanding she, you know, wanted other committees to look at it, and, you know, if we were to bond for $565 million in this session, I mean, obviously, everything else, that and the capital restoration, everything else would, would disappear. So I, it, her concerns are valid, and, and the local government is capable of, of putting more money in. Uh, that's, that's certainly appropriate, too. You know, people talk about, is this a precedent? Well, one of the measures we could set for a project like this, the City of Rochester and Olmstead County send $90 million a year more to the state treasury than they get back in county program aid, local government aid, and school aid. $90 million a year more. So if you want to set that as your, you know, your uh, threshold for the, saying, the state saying this is a, a, a special project, I mean, this is, is a you know, unique opportunity. I mean, Mayo is, is priceless, and it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's, it employs over 40,000 people now. I mean, about a, last time I looked was when I was in the Senate, so that's what, six, seven years ago, employed about 30,000, so their, their expansion. If you want to get a parking place in the Mayo system, it's eight-year wait. So, I mean, you know, we don't, if we don't keep pace with May, what Mayo needs to do to be competitive with Johns Hopkins and Cleveland and others, you know, that they, they are going to understandably have to look for other possibilities, and that would be catastrophic for this state, just, just devastating. So uh, we'll work it out. I'm, I'm convinced we'll work it out. Tina Smith's going to, you know, spearhead that, and you know, I, I think Mayo's flexible in terms of they, you know, want, I think much of anything, they, as I said, they want an assurance the state's going to be there, and we can't obligate future governors, future legislatures with, you know, appropriation commitments. So, you know, we have to work through that as well. But well, where there's a will, there's a way. But it doesn't doesn't surprise me, it doesn't concern me that the project's, you know, being considered every which way by the legislature as, as it should be. Anybody else? Time to go. All right. Thank you. Again, you were just watching Governor Mark Dayton unveiling his bonding proposal, which he says would put 21,000 people back to work. He also says the time is now to invest in the restoration and renovation of the Capitol building, and his plan echoes that with $109 million allocated to the Capitol building. The Senate does have a standalone bill to fund the Capitol project. The House does not, but the House is expected to release its bonding bill Tuesday morning, and you can watch it live right here on the Minnesota Channel. That hearing is scheduled to begin at 8.15.